Good evening and welcome to Speech Night Spring 2023. My name is Professor Ryan Guy. I teach over in the Communication Studies Department and for the last nine years it has been my absolute pleasure to coach and direct Modesto Junior College's speech and debate team. MJC's speech and debate team is actually one of the oldest campus teams that exists here at Modesto Junior College. In fact, we are celebrating our 100th year of having a team Team here at MJC. For the last century, Modesto Junior College students have participated in a culture of excellence as they prepared events and arguments and debates and oratory and took those events all across the state and country to compete against other colleges and universities. Tonight, you're going to get an opportunity to meet the next generation of Modesto Junior College speech and debate folks. And so in a minute here, we're going to bring them up and introduce them to you. But before I get to that, I just have a couple of quick notes. First off, my guess is that many of you are here tonight as part of a class requirement, perhaps for your Calm 100 or 102 class. Your instructor in your course probably gave you specific directions about how you should go about completing and doing this assignment. Tip number one is do what they told you to do. So if they gave you specific directions, you're gonna take a quiz, you're gonna turn something in Canvas, do that. However, if you didn't get clear directions, in the front of the room of the house, there were a variety of different pieces of paper. One of them was the critique sheet. This is a double-sided form that has folks listen and evaluate the speeches that they hear, as well as the debates that they watch in the second half of the evening, which will consist of five speeches and some periods of cross-examination. If you didn't get any other directions, filling one of these out would probably give you a good piece of advice. My second request is I know that we all have devices like this in our pocket and it can be really tempting to get on these when you are at a performance but just like when you go see a movie you don't want to be that distracting person that's ruining the show for everyone else so please silence these devices and put them away please don't take videos or record folks as they're giving their speeches and their events it's for their safety and everyone's enjoyment of the show with that I am super excited to be back here in person it has been over two years since we've been been able to offer an in-person speech night. During the pandemic, we were forced online, and frankly, it just wasn't the same. So I'm really excited tonight for you all to be able to come out here and experience oratory in public as you get an opportunity to see some folks that have worked really hard on their events over the course of the past year perform those events tonight. Before I turn the floor over to my partner in crime, Professor Tori Shemp, to introduce the team to you, I just want to do a couple of quick thank yous. First off, thanks you to you all for coming out tonight and supporting us and participating in this activity. We literally could not do it without you all. But I also want to give a big round of thanks to our school, the School of Arts, Performance, and Humanities, all of our support staff, our dean. They do a lot of effort to keep us running as a team, and we really appreciate their, uh, their work. Lastly, I want to thank the Communication Studies Department. All of your professors have really been godsends to us, helping us accomplish what we do, sending folks to us. Come, helping us come up with good ideas and events and pieces. And in fact, a lot of what you see tonight is really inspired by your, uh, by your professors. All right, with that, you've heard enough from, uh, from me. I'm going to go ahead and let's give a big round of applause to the co-director of forensics, Professor Tori Shemp. Enjoy the show, everyone. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing the MJC speech and debate team to all of you. So please join me in welcoming each member as I call them to the stage. First, we have Natalie Aguila Stanhope. <laughs> Tristan Seha. <laughs> Eve Dowdell. Kylie Duncan, Ghost Eliason, Jacqueline Gandara, Sindel Hillis, Ronnie Imberg, Michelle McKee, Brandon Reese, Kayla Roslin, Jacob Stockberger, Dominic Torres, and Peter Tran. One more big round of applause for these folks. 
All right, tonight you are going to hear from some of these students performing events that they prepare and practice diligently and compete with around the region, state, and nation. At this point in the evening, I'm going to turn it over to our two masters of ceremony, Natalie and Sindel. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. The first event you will see tonight is communication analysis. This type of speech introduces interesting or controversial co communication artifacts and seeks to help the audience understand them by analyzing them through the lens of rhetorical theory. The speaker you will hear from tonight is Eve Dowdle. This is Eve's second semester on the team. Please welcome Eve with a big round of applause. Close your eyes. Imagine you're sitting in a theater. The stage lights slowly illuminate and you see a dancer, a ballerina, dressed as a princess. Just beautiful. Now, I want you to keep that ballerina in your mind, but open your eyes. Did you imagine the princess this way? Or did you see a white dancer? If you did, you're not alone. It took over 10 centuries for a black dancer to play a background role in Swan Lake, and even longer to play a lead. It wasn't until 2015 when two black dancers, Misty Copeland and Brooklyn Mack, were cast in the leads of Swan Lake. Infra reported in 2015 that a black dancer is up against the idea that the swan must be Snow White, and so must her prince. So. How did Copeland and Mack challenge outdated ideas? And has there been lasting change since 2015? Today, we will ask the following research question. How does Misty Copeland and Brooklyn Mack's April 2015 performance of Swan Lake at the Kennedy Center challenge the social construct of ballet? To resolve this question, we will step through an exploration of the theory lace up some analysis before finally pointing out three implications. So, let's step through an exploration of the theory. In Henri Lefebvre's 1991 work, The Production of Space, he proposes a spatial triad. He postulates that space is socially constructed through relationships and experiences. Let's discuss perceived space, conceived space, and social space. First, perceived space. This is where the body and material space interact. For example, we might perceive a room with individual desks. Next, conceived space. This refers to the thoughts, languages, memories, relationships, strategies, and other abstract information we understand about our surroundings. For example, we might conceive that that room with desks is meant for learning. In ballet, it can refer to the knowledge dancers have of a stage and how they should move about it. Finally, lived or social space. A 2021 article from the Urban Design Group says that this refers to the social meaning we attribute to a space. This meaning is created through discursive practices and norms. We do social space by living our everyday lives, which can lead to social hierarchies that influence power dynamics, belonging, and implicit values. Understanding the spatial triad and the interdependence of these spaces can help us with our analysis of Copeland and Mack's performance at the Kennedy Center. So, let's apply Lefebvre's theory to the artifact. A 2021 article for Pride magazine details Copeland and Mack's performance, describing their roles as important steps in challenging racial stereotypes. Using the spatial triad, we can analyze this claim. So, let's look at the perceived space. The Kennedy Center. An April 2022 article for Medium explains that the center is a living memorial and represents the cultural diversity of American arts. This background is what led Chant Planners to choose the venue. Organizers sought to present a diverse Swan Lake, and the physical location embodied principles of representation and accessibility. In 2019, the Washington Post reported that the center is accessible to all with its outdoor video wall that streams indoor performances. 
Next, let's apply concede space. When major outlets reported on Copeland and Mac's performance, and many of them were quick to describe it as rare and unusual. Instead of celebrating a new direction in ballet, these discursive practices highlight Copeland and Mac's otherness. A 2015 article for Good Black News argues that Copeland and Mac being cast as leads would be seen merely as appropriate next steps in their careers, if they were white. We can also see concede space in the attitude within the ballet space. Copeland reported in a 2022 interview for NPR that people often see black Americans and think, you should be doing your cultural dance. Whereas white Americans aren't told they can't do this European art form. Thus, the way we talk and the way we think about black dancers often indicates they don't belong. Finally, let's apply the concept of social space, or our implicit values and social roles. Ballet tradition tells us that the roles of Prince Siegfried and Odette should be played by Snow White dancers. Copeland and Mack's performance was exciting because it countered this narrative. In the previously cited 2015 NPR report, Simone Newman, a young black dancer, says Copeland and Mack gave her hope. However, progress? It's often slow and incomplete. Pulitzer Prize winning dance critic Sarah Kaufman printed a critical review of the performance. She described Copeland's portrayal as a work in progress, critiquing her fuete and pace as too powerful. Kaufman speculated that Copeland's commanding presence would fit better in roles that demand vitality. This reflects ongoing stereotypes that place black dancers in athletic, powerful roles, not subtle, elegant ones. Now that we understand the theory and how it applies to the artifact, let's point out three implications. First, this performance reconceptualize Swan Lake in the ballet industry. Casting dances of color disrupts a tradition of exclusion. For example, a 2020 edition of the Players' Tribune reported that Copeland was previously casted as a background dancer in Swan Lake. However, after tirelessly training for the role, she was pulled because a staff member felt she would ruin the aesthetic of it. Next, the implications for the broader ballet industry. Last year, the Kennedy Center featured Reframing the Narrative, a dance performance featuring all dances of color that again challenged normative whiteness. On the other hand, racism persists. In 2020, the New York Times reported on the experience of Chloe Gomes, the only black dancer at the Stats Ballet Berlin. While preparing for her Swan Lake performance, Gomes was told to apply white skin paint to achieve physical uniformity. However, as Benjamin Millipede, the former director of the Paris Opera Ballet says, what makes the scenes work in Swan Lake is a sum of everyone's energy and individuality not a display of pancaked white people. See, Millipede is on to something. In fact, Copeland and Mac taking the lead should not be seen as the anomaly. If anything, all white ballets should be the anomaly. Finally, let's see how this performance challenges our understanding of diversity. You've probably heard the metaphor of America as a melting pot. In many ways, that is how ballet has treated its increasing dancer diversity accepting them by changing them. Ibu Patel, a former member of one of President Obama's advisory council, explains in a 2022 Desert News article, the problem with the melting pot metaphor is that it too often encourages us to melt away distinctive identities. Patel proposes the metaphor of a potluck instead. He writes, potlucks celebrate pluralism. They rely on the diverse contributions of a diverse society. If everyone brings the same thing, the potluck is boring. In this way, Copeland and Mack introduce exciting differences. The question is not whether or not they can perform the ballet the same way white dancers have performed it, but how they can expand our understanding of what ballet can be in the first place. Now that we have pointed out three implications, let's conclude. Today, we examine the following research question. How does Misty Copeland and Brooklyn Max 
April 2015 performance of Swan Lake at the Kennedy Center challenged the social construct of ballet. Through theory, artifact analysis, and implications, we discovered that their performance led to meaningful, but at times incomplete, change in the last eight years. The right to creative expression must belong to all dancers. Copeland and Mack have shown the importance of challenging implicit values and stereotypes to a community dancer of any color to center stage. The event you are about to see is impromptu speaking. This is a limited preparation event. In this speech, the speaker is given a set of random prompts and has only two minutes to prepare a five minute speech. Despite the time crunch, the speaker is still expected to be organized, produce substantive content, and deliver the presentation with style. Tonight's impromptu speaker will be Tristan Seha, this is Tristan's first semester on the team. He recently took third place in this event at the regional tournament. Please join, in, please join us in welcoming Tristan. Opening prompt now. Time starts. Thirty seconds done. One minute passed. One thirty passed. Okay. Iron Man is an inspiration to everyone. Iron Man was given a hand that he did not use wisely. He was left lost without purpose, without any direction. It took an outstanding event for him to find this direction and gave him purpose. The quotation I received today is, life doesn't give us purpose, we give life purpose by the flash. And now I interpreted this quote as, we choose how to live our lives and what makes our lives worth living. Our decisions lead to what we care about and those decisions give us purpose. And I agree with this quote. In order to show this, I will be previewing my three main points and giving three different lenses to look at this quote. The first of which being a movie, Speed Racer. The second, another movie, The Goonies. And a third being a video game called Rise, Son of Rome. Now, shifting into first gear, we're moving over to Speed Racer. This, or this movie follows a racing family that thrives on racing. They love to race and they love to race for their family. Our main character, Speed, has no purpose, though. He loves racing, but he doesn't know why he's racing. It takes an outstanding event 
of realizing that everything is rigged, that there is no reason to keep racing if there is no actual outcome that can be controlled. A major CEO real, er, describes this to Speed, and Speed ultimately is left with nothing. He realizes that everything that he's been doing to this point has been worthless, that if he, racing is changing and he's not allowed to make change with it, there's no point to racing, that he has no purpose. Being left without purpose, he's lost. He doesn't know what to do. He tries leaving his family to try and save them from some of that loss, from some of that lack of purpose. He's ultimately causing his family pain by staying, but by leaving, he'd cause more pain. Without purpose, he had no reason to keep going. It wasn't until he finally found the reason and finally found purpose that he actually decided why he was racing. He realized that he was racing for his family, racing for love, racing because he wanted to. Not because someone decided he was going to race, not because someone paid him to, because he enjoyed it, because it's what his brother loved doing. Whether or not he found purpose was the turning point for speed entirely. He found this purpose, and purpose made his life worth living. It made racing worth racing. He found purpose, and that purpose led to change. And he changed the racing industry forever. Now, speaking of forever, this movie goes on for quite a long time, but the main purpose is there, the Goonies. The Goonies are a bunch of ragtag kids that have no business looking for some lost treasure. Now, they are threatened, and they are left without purpose when their homes are being threatened. They're being threatened that they're going to tor be torn down and replaced with a golf course for rich people. And ultimately, that leaves them with nothing. They're left thinking this is the last weekend that they have to spend with each other. Now, spending the last weekend with your friends, knowing you may never see them again, is awful. Without that, they are left with nothing. They realize that life just sucks, that they had no reason to keep moving, no reason to keep pushing forward, to live life. But together, they realize that they can change this, that if they band it together and they work together, they could possibly find a way out, that they can give their life purpose again. They found lost treasure. They were able to stick it right to that rich guy, saying no golf course will be built on our homes. We're staying right here. It doesn't matter whether or not you keep trying. No matter what, we'll find a way, because ultimately, we are filled with purpose. They were filled with the purpose to push on, to fight for their friends, to fight for staying with their friends, the same way many of us would fight to stay with our friends or our families. Ultimately, they proved that living life with purpose is how everyone should live. And without that purpose, life is meaningless. Now, meaningless life doesn't come with woes. In the video game, Rise, Son of Rome, we are taken to the Roman times back when everything was in turmoil. Now, Rise, Son of Rome follows a main character who has lost his family, who's lost his entire world. The Roman civilization is crumbling before his very eyes, the very thing he stood to protect. And he's left with nothing. He's left without a reason to fight. He realizes that life is left with nothing, that he has no reason to keep pushing forward. But he finds purpose. He realizes that he needs to be the standalone guardian to protect the Roman Empire, that without him, it would fall. And without him, it would have fallen. He was able to show that giving life purpose and having purpose to push forward and live on and fight with everything you have was the ultimate way to win. Purpose was his greatest ally. Purpose is our greatest ally. No matter what you do in life, have purpose, just like he did. Now, purpose can be applied to everyone's life. Whether or not you're going through your job, whether or not you're just trying to live your life in every normal way, things happen and you may, left, or may be left without purpose. But I'm here to tell you that you should find this purpose. The same way that Iron Man was lost in that cave and had to take a look at himself and realize that 
He's been doing things that he never wished he could have. Making bombs to destroy people? Why? He took a look at himself, and he realized that he was destined for a greater purpose, for a purpose that I hope many of you are able to show, and many of you will find. Now, I received a quote today. Life doesn't give us purpose. We give life purpose by the flash. And I interpreted this quote as we choose how to live our lives and what makes us want to keep moving forward, that we are the ultimate deciders of why we live. And I agree with this quote. And I showed it through three main lenses, the first of which was Speed Racer and his trip racing through time and racing through society. My second being the Goonies and their race against the rich people trying to build a golf course on their land. And my third being a video game, Rise, Son of Rome, and his tro toils trying to protect the Roman Empire. Ultimately, I hope all of you can leave here realizing that purpose gives us meaning. That with purpose, you can continue to push forward. That though you may seem lost and have no place to go, purpose is always there to drive you. Thank you. Next, you will hear a persuasive speech. This is a presentation that seeks to identify and describe an ongoing problem. The speaker uses emotion, logic, and credibility in an attempt to urge the audience to act on a controversial issue. Tonight, Kylie Duncan will present her persuasive speech. Kylie recently took first place with this performance at the Northern California Championship Tournament. Big round of applause for Kylie. When Cam was in the second grade, their mother started posting photos of them on MySpace and Facebook. Cam experienced numerous hospital visits, each one of those ending up on their mother's account, reaching her audience of thousands. When Cam was hospitalized in 2016 due to developing Bell's palsy, all they could recall was their mother, recording the entire situation to post on social media. Cam stated in an NBC News article on November of 2022, I needed a hand to hold. I didn't need a phone in the corner of the room recording me. Cam's experience is a prime example of sharenting, defined by Vanessa Cesarita Cordero in January 2021 on Humanium.org as a parent in charge of their child's well-being, distributing private details about that child via digital channels. And Cam is far from alone. Everyday families are at the center around growing tensions surrounding privacy, profit, and the social media landscape. Content creators are increasingly sharing family-focused media with their children taking center stage. However, decisions about that content, as we saw in the opening example, is left up to the parents. And there are no existing laws regulating children's labor on social media platforms. Thus, child labor laws must be reformed to include social media content. So today, we will first identify the problems surrounding family influencer content. Second, expose the underlying causes before finally describing some key solutions. Let's begin with the problems. There is a fine line between sharing a candid home video and carefully cultivating your child's online presence. Take the example of Jordan Cheyenne, described in a 2022 Newsweek article by Gerald Kaunga. In 2021, Jordan shared a video explaining that her family dog was sick and had little hope of surviving. When she thought the cameras had stopped rolling, she said to her eight-year-old son Christian, act like you're crying, and urged him to pose. While we might assume that family influencers make up only a small subset of all social media content, a 2019 report from Pew Research states that videos featuring children under the age of 13 rack up three times as many views as other forms of content. An April 2022 On Labor article by Melody Burke points out that content creators with one million followers can make more than $10,000 on, ju on just one post. This type of content creation has several implications in terms of children's privacy, well-being, and labor. 
Even families who do not set out to profit from their content have created a digital footprint for their children. A 2019 article from The New Yorker by Hua Su puts it this way. Sharenting exposes children to the larger digital world without their consent and deprives them of the choice to never be on social media in the first place. It becomes even more problematic when profit is involved, with some parents taking content creation to the extremes. A 2019 article from The Guardian by Julia Carey Wong relays the chilling story of Michelle Hobson. Hobson featured her adopted children on the popular YouTube channel called Fantastic Adventures. Not only did she permanently take all of her children out of school to focus on filming content, but she was charged with beating, pepper spraying, molesting, and starving her children if they failed to memorize their lines or participate. There is no doubt that we have entered unsettling territory. It's clear that we are facing a problem. Next, let's look at the causes. There are two key causes, a lack of policy and parental pushback. First, laws that protect children in the entertainment industry do not extend to social media. Traditional entertainment is regulated by Coogan laws, including requirements that a minor's working hours must be restricted and that a portion of their earnings are placed outside of parental control. But families on social media are not subject to any of these regulations. Parents become the gatekeepers of their child's online identity and the directors of their future online career. Granted, this isn't inherently bad. However, the previously cited article by Melody Burke points out that there is no easy distinction between the content that is okay and not okay. Burke writes, the reality of these arrangements proves that the lines are blurred between simply recording a child having fun, child labor, and child abuse. This will remain the case until we have standardized policies. Second, many parents push back the idea that they are making their children work. I mean, childhood goes by quickly, and aren't these families just documenting it? I think most of us could agree with this argument. But it's a different story once it's monetized. Good intentions are not enough to resolve the sticky gray areas created by family influencer content. Take the example of Bee Fisher and her family. B runs an Instagram account with a hefty following that features her family of five. She tells Wired in a 2019 article by Emma Gray Ellis, I don't want to have a child 15 years from now sitting in a therapist's office saying that my parents made me take pictures every day. If there's days that they're not into it, then they don't have to be. Well, unless it's paid work, then they have to be there. There are countless examples like this where we see that it's play until it's not. It's genuine emotion until it's not. It's these times when good intentions are not enough. After all, as former child star Sheila James Cool points out in the previously cited Guardian article, I don't care if it's simply unboxing presents. That's work. It's not play if you are making money off of it. Now that we have identified the problems and exposed the underlying causes, let's now describe important solutions for children's law reform. First, it is imperative that we amend our state legal statutes to ensure children on social media are extended the same protections as other child actors are. Every state and U.S. territory already has laws that require child earnings to be protected in a trust account and requires that minors must obtain a work permit from their state prior to working as a child actor. Extending these laws to include monetized social media would go a long way. One practical way to enforce this is to require social media platforms to add Coogan protections and work permits to their monetization standards. In other words, a creator would not be approved for monetization without being able to verify compliance. If amended, this would mean that parents who use children in monetized content would first have to obtain a work permit from their state and then ensure a portion of those earnings are placed in a trust. Acting at the state level would also extend safety protections for these children. This would limit a child's work week to six hour days and no more than five days a week. It also ensures students remain current in their schooling and mandates oversight for wellness and living conditions. To help make this solution a reality, I have created a website with information about how you can advocate to your state representatives. Take a few minutes after this speech to contact your lawmakers and demand that they act to extend child actor laws to these children. 
Next, it is time for the United States to join other nations and enact a right to be forgotten law. This legislation, modeled after the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, would let child social media stars choose to erase any data that was created and distributed when they were under the age of 16. For some, this content is a public record of a traumatic time in their lives. My aforementioned website will link you to resources to join the movement in advocating for the right to be forgotten. Finally, I have included resources on my website describing how parents and guardians can make informed choices when sharing their children's images and videos online. Today, I sought to convince you of the pressing need to protect children appearing in online content. Through problems, causes, and solutions, it has become painfully clear that now is the time to act. Please scan my QR code after the speech to visit my advocacy website. When Cam moved away from their mother, they finally felt solace in posting what they wanted and the privacy that they now owned on their own accord. Cam is now 23 years old and now advocates for kids in situations that were just like their own. They go on to state in their video, posted on August 21st, 2022, that kids are people, not accessories. And while parents may have good intentions, their impacts cannot weigh them more often than not. After all, we decided decades ago we needed to ensure children who appeared in entertainment media are protected. It is time that we make sure that the next generation of kids does not get left out. We've got the lights, we've got the camera, and now it is time we must take action. We have come to our final event, debate. In this style of debate, speakers are randomly assigned to argue opposing sides of a controversial issue. Debate is a true test of critical thinking and strategy because speakers most often argue for a side they might not personally agree with. Despite this, the speakers must identify and present a valid and compelling case in order to win. In this event, debaters follow a formal structure they take turns presenting their arguments within set time limits. In this debate, you will hear from an affirmative speaker and a negative speaker. Tonight, our debaters are Brandon Reese and Jacqueline Gadan <laughs> Gandara. Uh, Brandon recently took gold in this event at the Northern California Championship Tournament, while Jacqueline previously took silver at the Tom Hawk Invitational Tournament. I'll now turn over the floor to our debaters. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. One more thing. In this event, audience members can show support for arguments they like by knocking on the side of your chairs or stopping during the debate. Show your side for whatever arguments you do agree with. All right, welcome and thank you for joining us at the Spring 2023 Speech Night. Today we are debating the resolution, when it comes to romantic relationships, technology does more harm than good. My time starts now, starting with a bit of resolution analysis. Let's define some key terms. First, I wanna define romantic relationships as a relationship with someone you know or have romantic and sexual feelings for. Relationship as in the state of being connected to someone in some way, shape, or form, and harm as impacting something in the case, in this case, romantic relationships in a negative way. For this weighing mechanism, we're gonna prove through logic and evidence that when it comes to romantic relationships, technology does more harm than good. If I'm not able to convince you that, that uh, or if my opponent proves that the opposite is true, then you should vote for him. Now, on to some background. With the rise of new technologies, we've finally seen the rise of a new digital era. With this comes a new set of social problems um, as technology becomes interwined in everybody's everyday life. More recently, we've been noticing how the use of technology impacts social skills. But does this really have an impact on romantic relationships? 
A 2023 article from The Guardian describes online dating as soul-destroying, unnerving, and transactional. Today, we'll see why this is true through two contentions. My first contention is transactional love. One of the most noticeable technological contributions to the world of dating that I'm sure we're all very familiar with is dating apps. If you remember being new to the game, then you also know how, how wild things can get on there. If you don't have someone guiding you through, it can be overwhelming because most people aren't looking for a serious relationship. And as women, not knowing the ins and outs of a dating app game means you're probably going to match with a bunch of weirdos and creeps. My claim is that dating apps encourage people to treat love as a commodity that can be easily traded and discarded, swiping left or right um, forces people to judge people solely on their physical appearances and not, and not on their um, uh, deeper qualities such as personality and values. My claim, uh, my evidence for this is that Arthur Brooks, host of the podcast, How to Build a Happy Life, he points out in a 2022 episode that dating apps offer the same experience as online shopping. This leads to people making snap judgments about potential partners and prioritizing external characteristics over deeper qualities. Let's put this into perspective. Taking a good selfie is an art in itself. I still haven't really mastered it. So, considering the wide variety of people on these dating apps and the large amount of guys that don't know how to take selfies, this, imagine all the possible partners you're missing out on because someone just doesn't know how to take a good picture. There are two impacts to this. The first impact being that dating apps deny us of our full humanity. A 2020 article from The Atlantic explains that technologies have emerged that make the market more visible than ever to the average person, encouraging a ruthless mindset of assigning objective values to potential partners and to ourselves with little regard for the ways that framework might be weaponized. Users are reduced to a series of traits that are deemed desirable or undesirable. This does not take into account that humans are much more complex than astrology signs and basic hobbies. The second impact is that dating apps create echo chambers. The previously cited podcast by Brooks points out that most apps match people based on similar traits. This decreases our exposure to diverse but complementary traits that others might have. And for my second contention, I'm going to call this undermines commitment. My claim is that the use of technology in romantic relationships makes it harder for people to invest in long-term relationships and commit to building something meaningful with another person. My evidence for this comes from Omri Galath, professor of social psychology at the University of Kansas. Professor Galath told Brooks in this previously cited podcast that in-person self-disclosures are correlated with higher levels of intimacy and satisfaction which online self-disclosures do not have the same effect. Thus, we, let, we see less committed in commitment in these relationships. In a 2020 Pew Research article, it's also mentioned that 40% of people who were in sur surveyed said they were bothered by their partner's use of technology, while 4 in 10 said their partner, their, um, their, they were at least sometimes bothered by their partner's use of technology. So this, so however, strong romantic relationships are key to well-being. A 2018 report from the Nova Scholar Handbook of Well-Being explains that romantic relationships are associated with stronger sense of well-being, intimacy, companionship, and happiness, and lower levels of mental illness, distress, substance abuse, psychological health, com psychological health complaints, mortality, and morbidity. All of which a 2020 Medical News Today article says technology worsens. So we first saw how dating apps can dehumanize users, and second, how technology can reduce long-term commit, committed relationships, which are key to mental and physical well-being. Thank you. I'm open to cross-examination. Thank you, Jackie, for that speech. We now move to two minutes of cross-examination. All right. So how's everyone's first speech night going? That's what I love to hear. All right. First question. I want to just get some clarity on the weighing mechanism. What do I have to do to win this debate? Sure. I can clear that up. There are two ways to win this debate. Op option one is to convince our audience that technology is not harmful to romantic relationships. And option two is to convince them that it is, in fact, beneficial to romantic relationships. Awesome. One more question. In your first contention about how dating apps make relationships more transactional, 
Uh, why is this true of technology-enhanced relationships compared to those that start face-to-face? -face? I think it's because online dating apps remove humanity from interactions and folks see potential romantic partners like items on Amazon. Um, in face-to-face -face dating, you're forced to see the person you're talking to and consider them as a human being. And it just doesn't seem that way when you're just swiping uh, pictures and faces. So. Awesome. I have no more questions. Thank you. Next, we'll recognize our negative speaker for a speech not to exceed six minutes. Awesome. Thank you all for coming out here today. What we are able to do wouldn't be possible without you guys being here, especially those that are here because your professors are forcing you to, here, to be here. So thank you for being here. Um, first, I will start with some counter contentions, and then I will address what the affirmative brought forward. All right, my timer will start right now. All right, my first contention can be titled Long Distance Relationships. Technology can help people maintain long distance relationships. One of the biggest advantages of technology is that it has made it easier for people in long distance relationships to stay in touch. Video calls, messaging apps, social media can all help people feel more connected, even if they're miles apart. A 2013 study published in the Peer Review Journal of Communication found that tools like chat, social media, and video conferencing led couples in long distance relationships to have better outcomes, including more self-disclosure and positive feelings towards their distance partner. In the 2020 issue of the Journal of Clinical Neuroscience, researchers argued that technology, particularly during the pandemic, has created useful tools to relational maintenance. In their study, they described ways long-distance couples pushed some technologies beyond their intended purposes. Some couples would toss images back and forth all day on chats like FaceTime for hours at a time. Not necessarily talking to each other, but just being there together apart. Other couples have repurposed technologies such as smart lights, not designed for communication. One couple who lived, to, who lived in different cities because of their jobs set up smart lights in their apartments, and they would periodically set their smart lights to different lights showing different types of affections and is a nice little surprise for them when they show up after a long day of work. Thus, technology can actually help strengthen these relationships rather than harm them. Next, online dating. Technology can help people find compatible partners. Online dating apps and websites have made it easier for people to meet and connect with potential partners who share similar interests and values. This can be particularly beneficial for people who may not have the opportunity to meet potential partners otherwise, such as those who live in rural areas or just have busy schedules. Pew Research reported that as of February 2023, that over 53% of young Americans had used a dating site before, and that most of them have had have made it easier to find a partner who shared their interests. Thus, when it comes to forming romantic relationships, we can again see that technology does more good than it does harm. Next, I'll jump into the affirmative's contentions. Their first contention states that dating apps are dehumanizing. I argue that this isn't inherently true. Dating apps are a tool, and the users determine the application of that tool just like any other. If a user is filtering for similar traits, they would likely be doing that in real life as well. That means that the harm described by the app is not unique to technology-based relationships. You will see these harms in any context. Next, we'll move on to the affirmative second contention. The app claims that using dating apps decreases commitment. I disagree because according to Pew Research in 2020, 30% of US adults say they have used a dating site or app, and a majority of online daters say their experience was positive. 
the statistics go on to show that 12% of users say that have been, they've married or have been in a committed relationship with somebody they first met through a dating site or app. This means dating apps can actually facilitate the kind of committed, fulfilling relationships that the affirmative describes, thus showing that dating apps actually do good and warrants a vote for the negative. I'm open to cross. Thank you, Brandon, for that speech. We now move to two minutes of cross-examination. All right, starting with my first question. When it comes to long-distance relationships, do you know what percentage of their overall dating population are in those long-term relationships? Uh, yeah, this came up a couple times during my prep period. PR Newswire had a report in 2020 that gave two stats. The first was that 75% of couples had to have been in a long-distance relationship at some point and that 10% of couples continue to stay in long-term distance relationships even after they get married. All right, so you see that most people have an overall positive experience with dating apps, correct? Yeah. That includes both men and women? Yeah, the Pew 2023 data says that most people who've used those apps felt positively about them, and that across gender, gender lines, there was some mixed data regarding creeps using the apps, but most people still felt positive about their time on the app. All right, and do you have any statistics on how many of those long-term relationships end up successful? I unfortunately do not, but you are free to bring up some data in your rebuttal so we can talk about it. Thank you. That concludes cross-examination. Next, we'll recognize our affirmative speaker for a speech not to exceed three minutes. Just want to thank everybody for coming again and my opponent for presenting such amazing counter contentions. Um, I'm going to start off with a brief roadmap again. I'm going to start by addressing my first and second, uh, my opponent's first and second counter contentions, and then I'm going to present uh, my uh, second contentions in order. So, at, my time starts now. All right, first, my opponent's first counter contentions. My opponent discusses long distance relationships and the positive aspects of having access to technology in such situations. He goes on about, their, about how they're able to communicate to each other through video calls, messaging apps, smart lights. And um, he also mentioned a 2013 peer reviewed journal saying technology was a useful tool in the p pandemic and a 2020 journal stating that it's the same thing. But the resolution analysis here is if technology does more harm than good in romantic relationships not if it's incapable of being useful. The reality is that my opponent does not mention any real statistics showing that technology even showed a significant rise in success rates in these long-term relationships. Now, on to my second contention. The neg would have you believe that dating apps create committed relationships. I argue otherwise. A 2021 article on Medium explains that researchers from the Marriage Foundation found couples who met online are six times more likely to end up divorced. Um, in other words, even if apps lead to some marriages, they do not last. So, now on to my first contention. Transactional love. Technology encourages us to dehumanize potential partners and treats love as a commodity, reduced to left or right swiping. My opponent states that hookup culture is not, is not on the dating apps, but rather the users on the apps. But I have to disagree, as my 2020 Medical News Today article shows how impactful technology can be to your mental health and how the podcast discusses online self-disclosures, not having the intimacy and satisfaction level as in-person self-disclosures. And lastly, my second contention undermines commitment. Again, my opponent mentions that the overall, overall experience on dating apps is positive and that 12% say, the, that say they married or committed someone, with someone they met on a dating app. Not only is this percentage so small, but also doesn't consider the experience of the large percentage of women on these apps. 
a 2023 Pew Research article that my opponent um, stated um, has, I looked into it and 50% of women feel as if dating apps are unsafe. And finally, technology, technology when it comes to romantic relationships, although it can be used as a tool, is inherently more harmful than good and that warrants a vote for the affirmative. Thank you. Next, we'll recognize our negative speaker for a speech not to exceed five minutes. All right, just again, thank you to everybody for being out here. I know this is not the most exciting thing, but we are trying to make it the most exciting thing out there, and I think we're doing a pretty good job at that. Um, first, I'll jump right into the counter contentions and then move on to the contentions and then ultimately tell you why I'm winning this debate. All right, I will start my timer right now. All right, technology can be used to create positive effects on relationships. You don't have to just look at the couple that repurposed their smart lights because they couldn't live together. You can look at social media, messaging apps, all of these things that allow us to connect with our partners if we're not physically there with them. Because of this technology, these connections strengthen themselves while we're not there physically with them. Um, ultimately, because of this technology, it leads to stronger relationships. My opponent mentioned that people who meet online and get married are six times more likely to get divorced. However, that's all they said. What we don't know is the numbers behind that study. We don't know where this study was done. We don't know the sample size of this study. We don't know any of that information. It could, for all we know, this could be looking at the first six months of a marriage in a very small country that ultimately means nothing globally. It just, we just don't know. She, my opponent claims that dating apps reduce people to their physical appearance and whether or not they're good at taking a photo. However, in real life, if you are physically attractive, you are going to have more success as well. Appearance gets you in the, in the door. Without appearance, you're not gonna get in the door anyways, right? So, <laughs> a little hyperbole, but. <laughs> Without physical appearance, you're not having that first connection anyways. So, ultimately, the cons are in both contexts here, whether it's online dating or in-person dating. And that she talks about how dating apps will match you with people with similar traits. But again, it's the people that are doing the matching. Ultimately, they decide whether or not they're gonna swipe left or right on you. And after that, wouldn't you want somebody that you're similar to? If you enjoy fishing or hunting and you get matched with somebody that's an out or an indoor person, you're not gonna be compatible with that person long-term anyways. Wouldn't you want to find that out immediately rather than waste your time? She also mentions a lot of the creeps. And yes, that is an unfortunate reality of dating. You are going to run into creeps. But these creeps exist in both online dating and in real life. And in real life, there's that added element that that creep could follow you out to your car. That creep could follow you home and create a way more dangerous situation for yourself than if you were on a dating app where you simply unmatch them or block them and then report them. Ultimately, I think I am winning this debate today because technology can and is being used to create meaningful relationships with long distance partners and not only long distance partners, people that you are face to face with as well. 
And all of the downsides that the affirmative brings up, those are just downsides to dating. Those aren't downsides to online dating and technology-based relationships themselves. Thank you. Okay, this brings us to our last speech in the debate. We'll recognize our affirmative speaker for a speech not to exceed three minutes. Okay, once again, I want to thank everybody for coming and for my opponent for putting up a good fight. Um, all right, so I'm going to explain to you today why you're going to be voting affirmative today. Um, I'm going to start with a brief roadmap again. I'm going to touch on my opponent's counter contentions and then I'm going to discuss my contentions one more time. Um, my time starts now. All right. First, my opponent's first counter contention, long term, long distance relationships and how technology can be used as a tool. He mentions how, how there's multiple ways to use technology to strengthen long distance relationships, but he also never mentions how successful these relationships even end up happening. In fact, I gave information saying that people who met online were actually six times more likely than people who met offline to get divorced, which just shows how detrimental de technology is to romantic relationships. Now, moving on to my opponent's second counter contention. He says that apps create committed, that the neg would have you believe that dating apps create committed relationships. Um, but again, I disagree. Again, they're more likely to get divorced and they're also more likely to be less um, intimate and less satisfied in their relationships. Now, moving on to my first contention, transactional love. Having technology in romantic relationships reduces people to just faces and simple facts like hobbies and zodiac signs. Let's be honest, dating apps don't really show the true, uh, the true um, comp complexity that is a human being. When you may meet someone in person, you're, you're getting who they are, you're, being, you're able to decide whether you want to interact with them or not. When you're dating online, you can get catfished, you, can, you don't know these people really, they can lie to you. You're just seeing a picture that can, be, that can be completely fake or misleading, and you're just seeing staples of hobbies and interests that can also be misleading and misleading. And lastly, my second contention, com uh, it undermines commitment. I showed you that technology itself increases problems in me mental health, pro it increases mental health problems, physical problems, it, and, it, and it's even unsafe for women to be on these apps. He said that, that of course, in-person rela relationships also have that risk, but you're hearing from a man. <laughs> this situation, this, this article literally says that 50%, 50% of women, and that was, that's 50% of women and only 30% of Americans were, were really, um, were using dating apps and 50% of those Americans, those women and those Americans said that they felt unsafe on dating apps. We should take their word for it, not someone who is not, um, uh, not qualified to speak on that. So, with this, I believe that I have proved to you that technology is inherently more harmful um, and, and that warrants a vote for the affirmative. Thank you very much. Can I get one more big round of applause for Brandon and Jackie and the entire MJC forensics team? Well, folks, we are almost to the end here, but debates do have winners and losers, and how we're going to determine that tonight is based on your decision. So the way that we'll do this is I'll recognize each side, make some noise to that person if you thought they won the debate, and then we'll just kind of wait at the end and see how it goes. So in this debate, if you feel the negative did their job and convinced you that this resolution was not true, let's go ahead and hear you now. <laughs> And if you felt the affirmative did their job and upheld the resolution, let's hear you now. Thank you. 
I'll let you be the judge of that. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. If you want to learn more about the speech and debate team, come talk to these folks. Drive safe. Good evening. Thank you.